Welcome to Into Pittsburgh. I'm Christopher Whitlatch, your host, and each month on PCTV 21, we get to know a nonprofit organization that is making a difference in our community. And we invite you to get involved. Let's get into Allies for Children. Joining me today is Patrick Dowd. And though children don't vote, he is going to share with us why they are part of the political process. Welcome to Into Pittsburgh. It's great to Thanks have you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Allies for Children is a relatively new organization. That's right. Can you tell us how and, and why did it get started? Sure. Uh, so it is relatively new. We started in 2013, halfway through the year, so about two and a half years old. Um, and the, the idea sort of came to a, a group of civic leaders who said, look, we really need a, a stronger, bolder uh, advocacy organization here in the region, Allegheny County particularly, that's focused on issues and policy change particularly for children in our region and to some extent across the state. And so they came together to form the organization sort of in the, in the concept phase and, and that's what we've been working to build ever since. So what kind of uh, activities does Allies for Children do? Sure, so we're uh, an advocacy organization which means that we spend a lot of time working uh, with government pr primarily to try to change policies. So that means trying to change laws, I mean trying to change regulations, uh, but it's also, also practice change. Um, we work with partners, so allies. We, we, we can't do things by ourselves. We work in alliance with other organizations that are child serving and child advocating. And we pay particular attention, our area of focus at least for the moment is around health policy. Uh, that, that relates to children and education uh, policy particularly. So when we think about health policy, um, there have been a lot of changes in health care over the last several years. Um, most of it, I would say, would be good, um, but we also want to make sure that as those changes are, are put into place, that the policymakers are thinking also about the importance of health insurance, for example, for children, making sure that the services that children can receive through their insurance cover the things that children need. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done on that and really also making sure that the policies related to access, how do you get enrolled in health insurance, are not actually barriers that block children and families from, from getting health insurance. So we spend a lot of time with that and it's been an important couple of years as it, uh, as it relates to health insurance access. Um, we're very interested also in the in, in issues related to nutrition and food and, and students and health. Uh, particularly at that nexus of places of learning, so early child care providers um, or at schools. In fact, we're releasing a report in March uh, related to school breakfast and, uh, and how it's being done here in Allegheny County and connecting that with larger work uh, across the state. So a lot of focus on, on health policy and as I said, the other area of work that we're interested in is education. Uh, we spend a good bit of time focusing on uh, education funding here in Pennsylvania, and we could talk about that. That's a big topic. Um, but also issues related to attendance and, and things like crossing guards and their role in the lives of kids uh, as children make their way to and from school each day. So a lot of different areas. So children don't have a vote. Why is it important for them to be part of that political process? So it, uh, there's a lot of policy. There are a lot of laws that affect children. And you're right, they don't, they don't have the opportunity to vote. Um, and there are a lot of adult in issues and adult interests in the political process. And that's not bad. That's just a fact. And one of the things that, that the founders of Allies for Children envisioned was that this organization would be bolder, stronger as a voice for kid, kids without the adult interests. And so we don't have members. We don't have anything that really guides us other than what the evidence tells us is good policy for kids. And so Allies for Children is able to insert itself into a policy discussion with other organizations and say, wait a minute, we think this is, is actually the right policy because we, if we look at the evidence and the data, that tells us so. And so that's, I think that's why it's important for them to have a voice like our voice. Um, it's, it's good to have all the other voices at the table as well, but you really need a, a bold organization that's gonna focus on what's in the best interest of kids. I know there are some, some very, to me, shocking 
statistics uh, regarding a children, our children in Allegheny County, Western Pennsylvania as a yep. whole. Um, why is it important for Allies for Children to work here? And maybe we'll share some of those. Yes. So if you <clears throat> if you think about uh, you know our region, we're very lucky, right? We have we have um, a, 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 a region that's generally doing very well for some folks, but we know that there's disparity across the region, and so it's important that we make sure that as as we're doing well economically, for example, we make sure that all children are able to benefit from that, and we want to think about. We could, we could talk about education funding, right? Pennsylvania, as a as a commonwealth, has one of the most unequal systems, or uh, a system of the <clears throat> a funding system that promotes inequality more than any other state across the country. So, typically, school districts, and we have many of them here in Allegheny County, will try to fund their schools using local property taxes. And ideally, we would imagine that the state's role would be to come in and help make sure that there's a level playing field, mm -hmm. and that all children have they, they have uh, adequate funding uh, for their schools to meet the kinds of um, standards that have been set by the state. But if you look at the inequality across the Commonwealth, and here in Allegheny County, it's pretty great. And the state is, in fact, not playing that role. The state funding mechanism or structure is, in fact, just continuing or perpetuating that inequality. And that's not what we want. So we need to reform that. So we, we could think about that sort of work. Or you could think, again, about school breakfast. As I said, we're working on a report here. Um, if we were to look at where kids are getting access to food, we know that the school is an important place for that. And we know that a lot of kids are going to depend, for example, on that lunch meal as an important part of their, their diet for the day. Uh, and increasingly, schools, it's, it's not rapidly increasing, but it is, in fact, increasing. Schools are beginning to offer meals for children <clears throat> in the morning, um, but not necessarily to all kids. And we want to start to think about how do we expand that opportunity and how do we make it easier for kids so that... We, again, we're cutting down on that. That's a smaller disparity, but it's a really important one in the classroom um, because we know there's plenty of data to tell us that. And it's just logical. You have kids, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're hungry, you're not going to do well in the you're classroom. You're not focused. Exactly. And mm -hmm. all sorts of other issues are going to come up. So why, why, why do we have these disparate policies? Let's try to think about, obviously, school districts are going to have to do work you know, that's best for them. They're going to have to def define solutions that are best for them, but we can help them sort of identify the possible options, the menus there, and, and then again, cr try to create that equality so that when all kids are in a classroom, they have the funding that's equitable and they have the opportunities that are available to them to actually really do well in that classroom. I, I think that's, that makes sense, right? That's yeah. logical, right? Right. So. It's not so. so why are we doing not, it? It's not so. <laughs> I guess that's my question. So why are we doing it? Well, because there are there are like I said earlier that like let's again when we think about education funding, that's that's a, a bigger, easier thing to sort of use as a tool to explain uh, to answer your question. There are a lot of adult in issues and, and interests in the question of education funding. So when we look across the Commonwealth, you know, the state spending just in one line item, right? The state, the state budget has lots of lines where they call out the, the, the dollars expended. And, and one line item is called basic education funding, and that's $5.7 billion annually on a $30 billion budget. It's the second largest line item in the state. And those dollars get distributed inequitably. Now to try to start to change the way that that's distributed, now you, you and, and to do it without winners and losers, because none of us want to see children lose, now you have, now you have lots of challenges and it means we're going to have to do things potentially like raise taxes somewhere there's got to be revenue to pay for that so those those generate all sorts of questions and how do those dollars get driven out to districts should we consider the role of a charter school as far as the funding structure of a district in that equation should we consider local tax effort in that equation all of those kinds of questions make it really challenging for policymakers uh, and so again, we come in as, as an organization, and we're not the only one. There, there are organizations at the state level, Pennsylvania Partnerships for Children, for example, or in Philadelphia, Public Citizens for Children and Youth. There are a number of us across the state. And we come into those discussions and we say, whoa, hold on a second. You're right. We, there, there's this whole debate about charters and traditional public schools. Got it. But look, let's think about what's right for kids. Let's try to drive this policy in a way that's beneficial for all kids. So no matter which kind of school you go to, you're benefiting from this, this right policy of equitable and adequate funding for schools. So it, it sounds easy, right? But, but it actually means you have to go and do things like connect with legislators. You have to do things like mobilize lots of people to go to, pub, to hearings on the budget and all sorts of things like that to help 
convince legislators to do the right thing. So what kind of activities do you, do you use to organize the people, get to the legislators? Yeah. Um, what kind of advocacy methods? So uh, lots of different things to think about there, but first again, we, we do things in partnership with a lot of different organizations. So we'll work with many organizations that you, you probably connect with regularly as well that, um, that mobilize parents or that may have members like a union, for example, or um, business groups, like chambers of commerce and things of that sort. So we'll try to build alliances. And, and again, I'll use this school funding, uh, education funding campaign as an example. We have 50 different organizations from across the state. We have educators, so, so teacher unions and, and business officer associations and superintendent associations, school board associations, so what we call the ed associations, religious groups, and uh, we have civic groups, and we have regional groups. We have a lot of different organizations that come together with a lot of different constituencies, and we, we think about what's the best strategy for convincing legislators to move the policy in the agreed upon direction. Um, and we will then do things like common things, right? Like we'll use social media. We've, we've started to mobilize people using Twitter and even to some extent Facebook. We've mobilized people in the old fashioned ways. We get a bus and we go to Harrisburg and we have a rally. Um, we mobilize people to do things like write letters and uh, to make phone calls. So, so what I would say is it's a mix of sort of, you know, old school advocacy and, and the newer. Uh, media type advocacy. So this seems like a, a, a good spot to um, tell our viewers how they can get involved, yeah. um, particularly with Allies for Children. So you mentioned, you know, writing. There are a lot of easy things for them to do: writing a letter, sending an email, um, tweeting, whatever. Yeah. Um, how would they get in touch with you? To so, <clears throat> the e <clears throat> excuse me. The easiest way to get in touch with Allies for Children, you, you can always uh, just give us a call, uh, or you can you can look at us on the website, right? AlliesforChildren.org. So it's A L L I E S F O R Children.org, um, and then they can find us on social media uh, at Allies for Children uh, as our at, at Allies for Children on Twitter, and same on Facebook. So. Those are the first places that I would go. But again, we, we work in partnership with lots of other organizations. We're a member of, for example, the Campaign for Fair Education Funding. So again, websites and, and Facebook and, and twi Twitter, uh, Fair Funding PA is, is basically the, the, the basic handle there, website and others. Um, so they can get in touch with us, but they can also get in touch with other organizations. We work with A Plus Schools, uh, and uh, we work with the Education Law Center uh, their office here in Pittsburgh and, and other organizations as well, PennCan and, and a whole variety. So um, the point is that there are a lot of, they can in, perhaps even get involved through organizations that they're already connected with, I guess. Um, but I think when we think about people actually doing advocacy work, right, the, the most important thing here is to connect with the policymakers. We really want to make sure that we're getting as many people from as many different constituent uh, bases talking with legislators about a core issue because it's when you bring together that variety of people, you know, just again, thinking about this, this campaign, to have 50 different organizations from the, the breadth that I was talking about, it's pretty, hard, it's, it's pretty unusual. It's, in fact, it's mm -hmm. unique. Mm -hmm. And so, so to be able to go into an office with a legislator and say, we have folks from these different <laughs> constituencies and we're all agreed, you should support this particular formula. And I think the other thing it's important to remind viewers is, is that one person does have the ability to make an impact. Absolutely. You, know, you have a lot of power with social media. Um, so, all, all of these policymakers are on social media themselves and they do not like to be embarrassed, I'll say, on yeah. social media. Well, so, and, it's, and it's a positive. So they're it's, responsive. They're very responsive and it's a positive thing. And, and you know, s s elected officials spend a lot of time in meetings. Uh, and there are meetings where they're, they, they, it's not always required, it's required that they be present, but not so always required that they're participating, right? They, mm -hmm. they have their roles at certain times. So they're also, you know, and I'm, I'm a former elected official, there were times when I was using my phone because it, there was, it was not my turn and I was paying attention to, to like what, all the other things that were going on. And so it's a good, it's a, actually become a really interesting tool and I think we're all, legislators and otherwise, still trying to figure out how to utilize it. But it's again, it's an opportunity to get connected. Absolutely. And I think you're right, the, the role that an individual plays, whether you run a corporation or you're, you're managing a family, right? Mm -hmm. And everything in between, or both. Uh, these, the, the, the opportunity to get connected to your local uh, state legislator, your local council person, uh, executive branch to 
the the it's it's it sounds complicated, but it's very easy. No, and I think that I think another reminder I'd like to throw out there: um, if you haven't already register to vote, vote. The legislators all know who in their district has voted and has not voted. So you have a lot of power if you vote. That's exactly right. It's just as simple as that. And, and this is an election cycle, uh, which sometimes you, you, people think makes it easier. Sometimes people think it makes it more complicated as far as getting work done. But, but it is, you're right. It's time to get, if you're not registered, registered. Um, and it's, it's really, um, it's important that they hear from folks. The more people that they hear from, first of all, it's part of the system. Uh, that's how this works. The second thing is that um, they actually do care. I, you know, legislators, it's not, I, it's, I mean, you'd be hard pressed to find a legislator who genuinely doesn't care what constituents w say or believe. The question is how they respond to that, but they do genuinely appreciate hearing from folks. And so I think that's also something that people generally don't think about. It's, no, it's good to hear from you. Yeah, you're absolutely right. <laughs> so so you, you did mention it, and, and um, uh, you have a political background. Could you give us a little bit about that background? Sure. Um, so, so my, my first background is actually academic, right? I spent, I, I moved to Pittsburgh to, to, to earn a degree and um, really liked the city a lot and Lanny, my wife and I decided to stay here and I was teaching first. So that's actually my first calling. Um, but I, I got involved in a campaign for a school board seat and uh, ended up being the candidate, uh, which wasn't exactly the intent at the beginning. But, but ended up being a candidate for school board. So in 2003, I, I was elected uh, thanks to the work of literally thousands of people um, and uh, served on the, the Pittsburgh Board of Education for four years. Um, and I, I had this idea that the school district and the city could, could work together. And so I, in 2007, uh, ran for office and, and city council and, and went down uh, to city council uh, in another uh, pretty exciting campaign after another exciting campaign. And um, so I spent basically almost 10 years in elected office um, and really um, tried to focus on issues related to children, spend a lot of time working, for example, at the library as a board member, I don't know, all sorts of different work there as well. Um, and in 2013, when Allies for Children was sort of emerging as a concept, uh, uh, applied for the, the job opening. I'd never really thought about leaving elected office. Uh, I'd really enjoyed the work, actually. Um, but this was an opportunity for me to combine my, my interest in politics and my interest in children's policy and to really sort of do the two together. So I feel like I'm just, uh, I'm kind of doing the same thing just on the, the different, a different side. Uh, so it's, it's been kind of exciting. And um, now that we're there, and, and uh, I think you're most uniquely qualified out of <laughs> uh, my, my guests lately to talk about this, um, we had a show last year about the PA People Count campaign because of the budget impasse. Yeah. And uh, well, here we are, it's March, you're sitting with me, and the elephant in the room is PA still doesn't have a state budget. What does that mean to both our residents and particularly our children yeah. here in this state? So I, I think <clears throat> I may have a, a view that's slightly different from other folks on this, but um, some people will want to say that the process is broken and I think if you, if you look at Pennsylvania, and I know we've had budgets that have gone long, um, but in the past when those budgets have gone long, and even this year when it's gone excessively long, um, the, 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 the tensions, the debates are revolving around important issues related to human services, related to education, and how we're going to provide those services for, for the people of the Commonwealth. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I, I don't like late budgets. I'm, I don't think they're right. I think it's wrong. But I'm, I'm less worried about the process than I am about the people in, in the process itself. And I think we are in a moment in time wherein uh, we have some serious political decisions that need to get made. And there's some serious disagreement about which way to go. It's a, it's a political question. How are we going to fund education? How are we going to deal with long-term liabilities that the, the Commonwealth, the, the taxpayers, the residents of Pennsylvania have to deal with? How do we fix our bridges? And how do we uh, pay for pensions? And I could go on. There are lots of prisons and so on. So there are a lot of really fundamental questions that need to get answered. And the, the legislators, the, the people in the process, really need to work through this. And, uh, we need to we need to let them resolve this. We don't we should not let them off the hook, mm -hmm. uh, and we should not force them to resolve it prematurely. 
We need to get this thing resolved fundamentally and sincerely. The consequences, though, are, are, are striking. I mean, um, you don't see them. You can't see them because they're not people closing doors, at least yet. They're not people saying, no, we will not serve. Frankly, because educators, human service providers, that's not in their heart. They're not yeah, going to do it's, that. Yeah, it's their morals. Exactly. You know, they can never do that. What, you are, what, what is happening, though, is, is, and you can't see this, but it is happening. The, there is a gigantic cost being paid, particularly for kids, in the form of lost opportunity. So you only get to be in third grade once, I, I mean, for the most part. Right? You only get to go through that year of school, whatever it is, once. And if you don't have the opportunity to take advantage of an out-of-school time program after school, or if you don't have an opportunity to have uh, you know, the personnel that are required to provide you the things that you need or the advice that you, you deserve, then, then you don't get it. And it's not like we can go back and, and fix that. That has consequences for that child and all the children who experience that. And so, so this is a problem. I mean, I, 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 it's a real problem. We need to get these political questions resolved so that we can actually move forward and provide and serve in the way that we need to do that. But as we're waiting, there are costs. And um, I think we just, that, that they're very real. We cannot, we cannot ignore that. So is there a solution on the horizon? Do you see one? Yeah, I think, I, I do think that, um, I, I'm an optimist, so this is, you're probably asking the wrong person, but I do believe that, that the legislators understand fundamentally, and the governor, I mean, it's not, it's not just the legislators, that the, our governor and our legislator, legislative leaders understand that they have to resolve this, uh, and they also have to get the budget passed. Many of us would like to think that a budget will get completed um, before the summer, right? Mm -hmm. That may not happen. That may not happen, and we may actually be looking at a budget that gets passed after this election cycle mm -hmm. in November of 2016. Do the voters need to take a, a stand in this election? Well, I think in when order the, to get this to move, when the, when when in, in a nonpartisan way. So exactly. In, 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 I'm not I, blaming I, I, either party. No, no. I'm saying, I'm, put, I'm, let's I'm, put that out there. Not blaming either party. This is a bipartisan right. problem. In a nonpartisan way, I think that the the electorate has not only the opportunity but the responsibility to genuinely ask their legislators how they're going to solve this problem, um, and 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 it is incumbent upon all members of the House of Representatives and all members of the Senate and all members of the executive branch to figure out how this is going to get done. So, so we have an opportunity as House members are running for re-election or election and the, the Senate members who are up for re-election too, there's an opportunity to ask. And, to, and by asking, again, this goes back to what we were saying before, by asking, and I think asking, you don't have to be you don't have to be negative about this. You can ask in a very f informed and, and deliberate way, but by asking, you let them know that this is important. In fact, you can tell them that it's important. So I think that's where we need to be pushing. Um, but I think this is the opportunity to ask about it. So um, before we leave today, what is coming up? Uh, I know you have a report coming out yeah, very, we're very, very excited. soon. What, yeah. else is, what else can we look forward to for Allies for Children in the this year and the years to come. So I think um, we're, we're very excited about this work around school breakfast and we think that that, that is an important project. Um, we've, we've been working uh, with the city particularly around crossing guards and trying to figure out how to better deploy and better train and hire and, and, and all that mentoring work particularly with children. We've been doing a lot of work on that front and we're really looking forward to finishing out this year but more importantly starting the upcoming school year with uh, the city making some really important and, and positive changes for the crossing guards who are members of the Bureau of Police in the city of Pittsburgh and ultimately for their relationship with children across the city. And again, let's, uh, let's give our viewers how, how best do they get in, in so touch the, with you? So the, the easiest way is to, is to look on the website and there you can find our phone number and our emails and all of that, but that's alliesforchildren.org. Um, and then they can also, like I said earlier, find us on Twitter. Uh, and on Facebook and uh, two good ways to get started. And so the other thing on your website, you have some resources as well. So it's not just, uh, don't, don't just go to the website just to get involved, although do that. Well, and they can, um, they but can there go. are some resources there as well. What kind of resources? So the, the, the folks can go to the website. We, we, like I mentioned before, we tend to work on these two core areas of work and we try to provide some resources, reports and information. Uh, we have regular blog postings uh, of, of things related to that work and we're expanding our portfolio as we go along. So there'll be more 
more opportunities to read and learn um, and also to get engaged. Excellent. So leave us with one final thought. What should our viewers think about when they think about uh, children's needs in Allegheny County? Well, I think we've been talking a lot about the budget, so I'd, I'd put it there for now and that we want to make sure that folks are, are connecting with their elected leaders uh, wherever they are, whoever they are, uh, whatever political persuasion, and letting them know that this is a priority and that our legislators need to do the right thing as far as making an investment for the people and the children, particularly of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Excellent. Thank you. Definitely check out Allies for Children. Thanks, and, and thank you, Patrick, for being on the show. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Great to see you. Good to see you, too. I'd like to thank my guest, Patrick Dowd. If you've enjoyed this episode of Into Pittsburgh, then hit that like button and give us a comment down below. Now it's your turn to tell us what you are into. Maybe you have an idea that you want to make happen here in Pittsburgh. Leave it in a comment on YouTube or tweet it to me, at CS Whitlatch, with the hashtag Pound into PGH, and we just might feature your project on an upcoming episode. Thank you to PCTV21 and those that make this program possible. See you next month, where we'll get to know another local organization and how we can get involved and make a difference right here in Pittsburgh. I'm Christopher Whitlatch, and this has been Into Pittsburgh.